We're going to start pouring in. Good morning, everyone. We're gonna, we've just gotten started. We're gonna give everybody about two minutes to come into the room and then I will turn it over to our speakers for today. Um, apologize for the short delay in starting. Uh, we'll give you just a second, thanks. <laughs> Okay, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, this uh, Upgrade Oncology uh, Pathology Series for Nigeria with Project Pink Blue and the American Society for Clinical Pathology. We're very excited today to have our radi radiology pathology lung teaching cases, and we have a dynamic trio or a triumphant trio, I'm not sure how to describe them, of a uh, very, very well-known um, and, and world-renowned lung surgical pathologist, same kind of cytologist and same kind of radiologist, all from Harvard in Boston. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lynette Scholl, who is going to lead the group, um, and Dr. Paul Vanderlein is our cytologist, and Dr. Mark Hammer is our radiologist. As always, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, and we will answer them at the end. If you have a technical problem, please put that in the webinar chat. The series is being recorded and will be available on demand to you anytime after the session is over. And please make sure to do your post-session questions. And just a reminder that we only have a couple of sessions left, but there is going to be a break, so make sure you pay attention to the dates and times of the upcoming last sessions. And with that, I will turn it over to Lynette. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. Um, uh, it's really um. Uh, an honor to have, have the chance to participate today. And, and I, I would say it's been a lot of fun to put this talk together with uh, my colleagues, Paul Vanderland and, and Mark Hammer, who um, uh, work within the, uh, the ecosystem here at um, the, in the Longwood Medical Area and Harvard Medical School here in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, Paul and I actually uh, worked together for, for many years, uh, both training in the same program here at Brigham and Women's Hospital and um, uh, I think the three of us have worked together over the years um, in radiology, pathology, correlations. Uh, Mark is a, a wonderful um, uh, expert thoracic radiologist uh, who can offer a lot of insight into the diagnostics as well as strategies around um, uh, obtaining biopsies from lesions that are located within the chest um, and uh, always offers great differential diagnoses for us to contemplate from the pathology side. So um, uh, hopefully you'll learn a lot from this. We have a lot of content. Uh, we have over 150 slides to show to show you. We'll go through them quickly. Uh, we'll run through a whole bunch of different diff differential diagnoses um, of, of lesions that arise in the chest, focusing both on the mediastinum and um, the lung uh, and pleura. Um, so with that, we'll jump right in. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with the mediastinal masses. And the way we're going to do this is um, uh, Mark will, will start what, from the radiology standpoint, presenting the, the clinical backgrounds um, and the radiographic um, uh, presentation. Uh, and then Paul and I will trade off in uh, addressing the cytologic findings and differential diagnosis and the surgical pathology diagnosis. So from there, I'm going to go ahead and um, have uh, Mark, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, the, our first case, a 37-year-old man who presented with facial swelling and headaches. Um, so laboratory results revealed elevated AFP, LDH, and HCG. Um, and then he underwent uh, first a chest radiograph, which shows an anterior mediastinal mass. You can see that it fills in the retrosternal clear space. Um, and so a CT was then performed. Uh, and the CT shows, again, an anterior mediastinal mass, relatively homogeneous density, quite lobulated, quite infiltrative. You can see it kind of going around all of the great vessels. Uh, the patient's headache 
was caused by narrowing of the brachycephalic veins and um, superior vein cava, so causing sort of um, essentially an SVC uh, syndrome kind of picture. So with this very aggressive appearing anterior mediastinal mass, the things we tend to think about are, of course, lymphoma, um, aggressive malignant germ cell tumors, uh, and, uh, and potentially thymic lesions, particularly like thymic carcinomas. Um, so all of those things would be in the differential for this lesion. Great. And um, so uh, as we go through the cytology portion of each of these cases, I'll uh, describe, you know, the cytologic findings and, and hopefully uh, go through a number of different uh, cytologic preparations, again, to highlight differences we might see. Um, so here, uh, this, this large anterior mediastinal mass was sampled uh, via bronchoscopic approach, uh, as most of our lung lesions uh, in, in Boston are these days, um, uh, via EBIS tBNA. And so on this transbronchial needle aspiration of the mass, uh, we can see that uh, in this uh, Papa Nicolaus stained uh, thin prep slide, uh, we do have uh, different cell populations. And so on the left-hand panel, if we look at you know, the, the, the cells kind of at around nine o'clock, we do have some larger epithelioid cells with, you know, round to oval nuclei and real prominent nucleoli, um, much larger than the few scattered lymphocytes that we see in the background. And so for size, uh, uh, kind of as our, our measuring stick, we, we certainly have, you know, increased size of these abnormal epithelioid cells. Um, and then up at around two o'clock on, on the left-hand panel, we do have more of a cohesive uh, aggregate of uh, spindle to epithelioid cells with associated uh, uh, lymphocytes. And so really a nice example of what a non-necrotizing granuloma looks like on uh, cytologic thin prep preparation. And then on the right-hand panels, once again, on higher power, we see that we do have this relatively pleomorphic looking, uh, ugly, uh, uh, somewhat dis dispersed uh, cell population, uh, large prominent nucleoli, open chromatin, mo moderate, mild to moderate amounts of cytoplasm. And then actually right up at one o'clock in the very top panel, you can see mitotically active. And so, so certainly um, indicative of a malignancy. Um, some of the clues here, again, given that location and given the, the granulomatous inflammation with background lymphocytes, we certainly could be thinking about a germ cell tumor. Um, oftentimes, germ cell tumors uh, tend to have more of a high-grade look cytologically with the prominent nucleoli. Um, it does not look like a uh, lymphoma, uh, basically due to the paucity of, of lymphocytes. And also, the, you know, the lymphocytes are relatively small and, and, and uh, uh resting size. And so really doesn't look like a, 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 a large, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or high-grade lymphoma. Then I think on the second slide, I, for, I forget if I have any more cytology on this one. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we actually did have a cell block made here. And and I'll try to steer a little bit away from the cell blocks and leave most of the H&E um, findings uh, to Lynette on the surgical pathology side. But here, again, really nice example of that mixture of a background of small lymphocytes um, and then we do have uh, scattered non-necrotizing granulomas. But in the background, and especially on the left-hand panel, um, you can see kind of spanning from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, we do have this uh, population of more pleomorphic uh, epithelioid to slightly stellate cells. Again, uh, high-grade uh, nuclear features, prominent nucleoli, um, uh, and, and uh, moderate amounts of cytoplasm. So, so again, really, uh, you know, my differential looking at this uh, uh, would certainly be a uh, germ cell tumor would be at the top of my differential would have to do IHC to confirm that um, it could be um, more of like a lymphoepithelial carcinoma. I guess that could come into the differential here, but um, uh, but uh, certainly not lymphoma and not not an infectious or sarcoidal type process, given uh, the additional pleomorphic cell seen in conjunction with the granulomas. And so I think then we have the the uh, the, the histopathology to, to look at next. That's correct. And in, in this particular case, we um, obtained a, a core needle biopsy um, uh, for the, di uh, the diagnosis. And what I would, I would also point out that for a lot of the cases that we're presenting, um, we are, we're piecing together um, images often from different types of cases to kind of give you um, a sense of the spectrum. Um, so in this particular case, I think that we didn't actually have cytology information. You got some great representative images from Paul um, in this one, we we had a dedicated core biopsy uh, that that corresponded with the with the imaging that that Mark showed earlier, um, and this is what was seen on that core biopsy. 
Um, so I think here we're seeing a little bit less of the obscuring inflammation and histiocytic response that you might expect in something like a seminomatous germ cell tumor, but, um, but indeed it shares that same um, a pleomorphic cytology, large cells, um, fairly abundant cytoplasm, uh, large uh, vesicular uh, uh, nuclei with vesicular chromatin and very prominent nucleoli. Um, and of course, you can also see in the background that there's a couple of these cells that, that sort of share that same uh, nuclear uh, cytology, but have that multinucleated appearance to them. Um, and, and so stains were performed in this case. And uh, as you can see from the panels on the right, uh, these atypical uh, individual epithelioid cells are strongly positive uh, for nuclear cell 4 expression, as well as OX3-4. And then these large multinucleate cells show cytoplasmic beta HCG expression. So um, in the end, this was diagnosed as a malignant germ cell tumor comprised of seminoma with scattered syncytiotrophoblasts. Um, it was a very limited sample. I didn't give you a low power view, but it was just a couple of millimeters of lesional tissue that we had available for diagnosis. Um, as you can see from the immunohistochemistry listing, um, there were a number of, of um, markers that were positive supporting this diagnosis, as well as um, that beta HCG and some uh, GATA3 expression in those syncytiotrophoblasts. Um, and the cells, as uh, would be expected, were, were negative for uh, uh, lymphoid markers. Um, as well as um, a melanoma marker, a, um, HMV45. Um, so that is, um, that is that case. And we're now going to talk about um, some of the other uh, lesions that might be in the differential diagnosis. And we'll hand it back to Mark. All right. So for our next case, this is a 56-year-old man presented with neck pain. Um, and again, we see an anterior mediastinal mass. In this case, again, relatively homogeneous attenuation. Um, and the top right image here, I'm showing on bone windows where you can see that there's a mottled appearance of the manubrium just anterior to the mass, suggesting that the mass is actually invading the bone. Um, and I put also a PET-CT fused image here on the bottom right, FPG PET-CT showing the mass is highly FPG avid, although centrally necrotic. And again, you can see the invasion of the bone there. So again, same differential here for an aggressive anterior mediastinal mass. You would think about lymphoma, malignant germ cell tumor, again, depending on the age and all of that, but lymphoma, malignant germ cell tumor, and like a thymic carcinoma. Yeah, and looking at a, a, a cytologic preparation here, so this is a um, uh, an, an alcohol fixed uh, Papanicolaou smear. Uh, so really nicely highlights the nuclear features of this um, uh, of this lesion that uh, you know from the the radiographic appearance really does have uh, more of a malignant aggressive um, uh, phenotype. And so uh, here, looking at the nuclei, we do have a a, a, a good amount of nuclear pleomorphism, right? So it's not it's not a very bland, uniform cell population. We do have a, a, cert, a pretty significant degree of anisonucleosis. Um, and, and once again, a little bit more open chromatin, perhaps a little salt and peppery, you, you know, a little bit of granular uh, 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 chromatin quality that you might think about uh, high-grade neuroendocrine uh, tumor. Uh, however, there are um, big prominent nucleoli as well, which really would argue against this being a small cell carcinoma, you know, type of neuroendocrine tumor we can see, you know, in the thymic region. Um, around, uh, some of the other clues, so, so the oval to round shape of the, the nuclei, uh, kind of the multiple prominent chromocenters. And then if we look at around nine o'clock, you know, there's, there is a cell that does have a little bit of clinging pink uh, cytoplasm around the nucleus, so right at the edge uh, at nine o'clock on the screen. And so, you know, that's a little bit of a hint that hmm, we might be dealing with more something more along the lines of a squamous differentiation. And so uh, a non-keratinizing squamous carcinoma um, tends to have these nuclear features. And in the absence of clear-cut keratinization, it can be a little bit difficult just on the cytomorphology to rule in uh, squamous cell carcinoma. But we all know that the majority of thymic carcinomas tend to be um, uh, squamous, uh, uh, squamous, squamous uh, lineage. Um, uh, here we have a paucity of lymphocytes, and so really not really thinking about a lymphoepithelial uh, carcinoma um, or any of the, you know, the, the type B thymomas uh, might come into the differential. But once again, the nuclei are pretty ugly here. And so at least on the cytology, um, signs pointing towards a thymic carcinoma, likely squamous um, uh, in this instance.
And um, a core biopsy uh, was uh, was obtained, and um, I, I think you can you can discern that the quality of, of the um, cytology preparation that you saw far exceeds what we're seeing in this surgical biopsy, which is predominantly very dense hyalinized fibrous tissue. There's a few small nests of more hyperchromatic uh, cells scattered through, throughout. Uh, I would say in this particular entity, this is not an uncommon situation for us to face. And in fact, um, we, we've had situations uh, when we're performing frozen section diagnoses in patients with anterior mediastinal masses where the first five frozen sections we get are just benign fibrous tissue. And then uh, finally, we'll start to get sampling that actually begins to reflect the underlying um, epithelioid process that's really creating that mass effect um, and the, the aggressive behavior. Um, so if we actually zoom in on some of these areas, uh, you can see that indeed there are uh, these epithelioid nests of cells. There's quite a bit of crush, probably just a function of uh, the procedure um, and the fact that some of these nests are located on the edge um, of these four biopsies. Um, I think like much as, as you saw on the cytology specimen, if you look at, at some of the, um, the cyto cytologic uh, features here, you can see that we have fairly open chromatin and, 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 a, and prominent nucleoli. That's a nice visible one right there. Um, and there's a little bit more uh, prominent um, uh, 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 cytoplasm in these particular cases. And I suppose if you really squinted and looked uh, very carefully at some of these nests, you might even be able to see some uh, bridges uh, between uh, between the cells here in this nest. So uh, obviously on a case like this, it can be very helpful to have immunohistochemistry, chemistry. And, and we did indeed confirm our suspicion that this represented um, a carcinoma um, with a P40 stain, which you can see really very beautifully highlights uh, these nests of cells. And, uh, and as Paul indicated, we most commonly see um, thymic squamous cell carcinoma. So that would certainly fit um, in this scenario. And we also got some membranous hit staining. Um, obviously, when uh, we're, we're looking at squamous cell carcinomas in the thorax, uh, it, it's, it's difficult based on morphology alone to uh, assign it to origin in, say, the thymus or the lung or, say, from another site that's metastatic to the chest. Uh, in, in, a, in a clinical presentation like this, um, obvious uh, uh, predominant mass within the anterior mediastinum um, you would be pointing to a thymic primary, having the relatively convincing uh, expression of kit, as you see in this particular scenario, I think really helps to bolster that uh, uh, primary origin in the thymus. Other markers that we tend to rely on are um, PAX-8, um, as well as CD5. Um, PAX-8 can be quite variable. So in some cases, it's really beautifully strongly positive. In other cases, it's negative in thymic carcinoma. So, you, so it's not 100% sensitive. We'll often employ a number of different markers that tend to be expressed in the thymus um, if there is concern clinically about whether something could represent a primary lung versus um, a primary thymic squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so in this case, again, it is a thymic carcinoma showing squamous differentiation. Um, and that, um, that, that is the end of that case. Uh, we will move on to some other uh, lesions that can occur um, in, the, uh, in the mediastinum and back to you, Mark. Right, okay. So here, whereas those first two cases were symptomatic, this is actually a 55-year-old woman with an incidental finding. Um, she was undergoing lung cancer screening CT since she was a smoker um, and a finding was noted incidentally. Um, you can see on this, uh, on the left image, this non-contrast chest CT showing a kind of lobulated mass in the anterior mediastinum. Um, and um, I have both PET CT and MRI to show you. So the FTG PET CT shows kind of a moderate amount of uptake within the mass. Um, and an MRI was performed. Now I've put four images here um, to show some kind of uh, nifty little things that we can see here. So. You can see, and I'll actually draw your attention to that second panel where I put the arrows, um, which is an opposed phase image. So this, um, you will have darker, um, sort of a darker intensity if you have uh, fat within the region. I um, mean, you can see in that orange part of the mass that there's actually, that's become dark. Um, and that means that there's interspersed fat within that part of it, but the more anterior, more lobulated component does not have the fat in it. Um, and so that suggests the, the part of anterior mediastinal mass, if you have this nice kind of uniform interspersed fat, 
Um, that is what we see in uh, residual thymic tissue or thymic hyperplasia. And you can see that there's a component of essentially thymic hyperplasia within this mass, but there's a, a nice mass-like component that is not thymic hyperplasia. Um, and so we would presume is, you know, some kind of solid lesion. Um, I've also included the T2 and post-contrast images just showing, again, it's kind of a solid lesion, it's enhancing. Um, and so, you know, our differential for uh, kind of an isolated solid lesion in the anterior media center that's not aggressive in an older patient is pretty much thymoma, period. Um, certainly, we do see other things less commonly, um, but in this age range, um, thymoma would be like my, you know, number one, two, and three. Yeah, and so uh, uh, sampling this mass, um, uh, again, uh, by needle aspiration, uh, here we have uh, uh, a, a pretty clean uh, 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 smear. Uh, so this is a, this is uh, once again a Papa Nicola stain, stained uh, alcohol fixed smear, and on low power really highlights nicely. Uh, we do have a background, a very dehesive small lymphocyte, right? And so kind of that lymphoid component is is something to always look for um, on smears, especially on um, uh, uh, air dried. Uh, Diff quick or, or Romanowski type stained smears, um, you can sometimes see that background of lymphoglandular bodies, which again is a nice clue to see. Obviously, you couldn't see it at this magnification. But what I what I do want to highlight is that in that background of, of, of small dispersed lymphocytes, we do have more cohesive clusters of, of uh, epithelial cells. And, and if this were just sampling a lymph node or um, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, lymphoma, even you really would not see cytologically these cohesive, uh, sheets of cells in the background of lymphocytes. And so, you know, that, that, that biphasic cell population is, is helpful. And then, uh, from the cell block on the right-hand side of the screen, we can see that recapitulation very nicely. Again, background of small lymphocytes, no real germinal center formation in this little piece of tissue. But then interspersed with that, we have somewhat spindled, but uh, more epithelioid uh, 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 epithelial cells uh, present here. And so again, recapitulating uh, the, the normal architecture of thymic tissue, uh, but you know, sampling that, that solid mass lesion, you know, this really does look like a thymic epithelial lesion, the mixture of lymphocytes and um, epithelial cells were probably in the, the type B um, uh, thymoma uh, uh, spectrum, you know, B1, B2, something like that. Um, and probably not a B3 because we do have a good proportion of lymphocytes here. But um, uh, the last point here is cytologically, you know, the, the epithelial cells are pretty bland in stark contrast to what we saw with the thymic carcinoma, where the cells were um, more pleomorphic um, and with, again, much, much fewer uh, lymphocytes in the background. So kind of looks like a type B thymoma on this cytology here. So a, a thymectomy was performed uh, based on uh, that cytologic diagnosis. And the first thing I'm actually showing you is the background thymus. As, uh, as Mark had pointed out, there was a component uh, on the imaging of uh, suspected thymic hyperplasia with that mixed fat. Um, and then the, the denser, um, uh, the denser uh, components um, in, in that anterior mediastinum. Um, and so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, an older patient. I believe that they were in their 50s. This is more than the expected amount of thymic tissue that you'd expect at, in this particular um, decade of life. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a very nice uh, example of, of thymic hyperplasia that's present um, in the background. And um, this, again, was adjacent, oh, sorry, just a higher power view. You can, um, you can see the, the Hassel's corpuscles, which, of course, are always the helpful clue uh, for, for um, the pathologist who's looking at lymphoid tissue and mediastinum to uh, point you to the fact that it is indeed from the thymus and, uh, and not, um, uh, not uh, just lymph, uh, a lymph node um, in, the, uh, in the area. Um, so then if we look at the region of the, um, of the specimen that was more mass-like, uh, you can see you know, very uh, much uh, in keeping with what was observed on the radiology, a uh, sort of smooth contoured uh, lobulated mass with um, this very pronounced uh, fibrous lo uh, uh, lobules uh, within, the, within the mass. It again is relatively well circumscribed. Uh, you can see that it's sort of infiltrating into some of the, the fat, but it appears that there's um, overall uh, a, a, a fairly clean encapsulation. Um, oftentimes these will be removed 
um, with just a very thin capsule on them, there certainly uh, remains a risk of local recurrence um, for these lesions um, after their surgical resection, uh, but they, they will um, um, often have this kind of uh, a fairly thin plane that they're able to actually um, obtain between the mass and the, uh, the surrounding tissues. Um, as I think we could perceive from the cytologic preparations, it's a, it's a very blue tumor. Um, there, there is a lot of, of lymphocytic components um, in this tumor, and, but it has a variegation to it. So there's, there's an epithelial component and there is a, a, a lymphocytic component, which we can see obviously better on a high powered image like this. Um, so there's a large number of obscuring uh, lymphocytes and in the background, you can see uh, frequent uh, larger epithelioid cells um, and in a situation um, like this, where you can see often clusters of these epithelial cells together, uh, we would put this in the B2 thymoma category. Um, B1s, we would uh, typically uh, uh, render that diagnosis when there's almost complete uh, obscuring of the epithelial cells by lymphocytes. Um, and you'll just typically see one or maybe two visible epithelial cells um, scattered in, in that background. Obviously, if you stained it for epithelial cell markers, you could see that whole network really obviously behind those obscuring lymphocytes, but on an HD preparation, it can be very difficult to see in a B1. A B2, like this, they're a little bit more prominent. And then in a B3, the lymphocytes tend to be quite, uh, quite tend to be quite sparse, and that epithelial component is very prominent. Um, if we were to do uh, immunohistochemistry in this case, uh, a TDT would highlight those obscuring uh, T lymphocytes very nicely. Um, and then uh, uh, either a keratin marker, uh, a, a squamous um, marker such as P63 or P40, um, or a uh, transcription factor such as PAX8 or PAX1 can very nicely highlight the, uh, the, the nuclei of the epithelial cells. Um, in the background and, and, and kind of um, uh, bring that network of epithelial, epithelial cells to more prominence. So yeah, finally, that is a, um, a B2 thymoma with thymic hyperplasia in the background. Uh, and moving on to the next case. Right, so here again, we've got uh, an older patient, 75-year-old woman with, uh, again, an incidental finding on a CT. In this case, it was a CT done for a coronary calcium scoring. Um, a kind of a clinic similar scenario and again we have a relatively oval um, lesion in the anterior mediastinum on the CT. Um, we will often do MRI in these patients uh, because the differential here from the CT would be that either this is a kind of a complex thymic cyst or a solid mass um, and so the MRI is helpful here on the middle panel this is our key to weighted image which shows that it's kind of this intermediate gray level, uh, whereas we would expect the cysts to be very bright on the T2 weighted image. And then on the right image, that's the post contrast, again, showing it's enhancing. So it's, it's clearly not a cyst, it's a solid mass. And again, uh, in this case, from a radiolog radiologic standpoint, the differential is pretty much thymoma and not much else. Yeah, and Mark, if you don't mind me kind of having a little crosstalk with you here. Um, uh, so it's kind of thymic carcinomas versus thymomas, right? Um, it, it seems like it's pretty clear, like for the thymomas, right? Very well circumscribed, uh, nice tissue planes. Um, for the thymic carcinomas, um, are there things radiologically you can hang your hat on? You know, pedividity, kind of the more infiltrative, destructive growth pattern? Or like, what are you looking for to kind of tease those two apart? So that's a great question. You know, the, the answer is there's a lot of overlap on imaging, both from the sort of CT standpoint, in other words, aggressive versus well circumscribed, um, and, and on the FPG PET, mild uptake versus intense uptake. In general, the higher grade, the, you know, the more aggressive thymomas, the B3, the carcinomas, those tend to have more FDG uptake. They tend to be a lot more infiltrative, aggressive looking, irregular, kind of lobulated margins, infiltrative, um, you know, invading other structures. And your more kind of on more benign categories of type A, B1, you know, um, tend to have much lower FDG uptake. In fact, you may see very little FDG uptake in those, um, tend to be well, well circumscribed, like in the case we, we just looked at. Um, so, you know, as in kind of broad strokes, you can make that you know, you can kind of make those general statements. Um, but in reality, uh, there's a lot of, of overlap and you can see well-circumscribed lesions that turn out to be carcinomas, for example. Um, we've definitely seen that. So 
Um, we really refrain from trying to make a specific diagnosis in that regard, um, you know, before a biopsy is obtained. Um, and really the, the role of imaging here, I think is to, you know, help the, the treating physician figure the surgeons aside, do I go straight to surgery? Can I take this out? Um, and whatever it is, we'll deal with it. Or is this something where I can't cut it out? We need to biopsy it first and then kind of, you know, work on a neoadjuvant, uh, you know, therapy setting. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, super helpful. And, you know, great uh, tie in. So then, you know, when when confronted with thymic epithelial lesions, you know, presumably on cytology and, and small biopsy as well, it can be very challenging to give a definitive, you know, classification. You know, is it a B type, you know, B1, B2 thymoma, um, uh, you know, type AB? Um, or, you know, is it, you know, is it a kind of a low-grade thymic carcinoma, right? And so that's where the radiologic correlation is important, you know, the, the pedividity, the infiltrative nature um, to couple with what we're seeing on the slide. Because obviously on cytology and, and, so, and sometimes less often on small biopsies, especially core biopsies, it can be difficult to demonstrate an infiltrative growth pattern, right? Um, uh, and so really it is very useful to have this, this communication between cytology, uh, pathology, and, and radiology. And so, so here for, for this, again, uh, radiographically, you know, all signs pointing towards a thymoma. Um, here we, we have some air-dried uh, diff-quick or Romanowski-type uh, stain slides uh, that show uh, a cohesive spindle cell population. Uh, and there are a few lymphocytes uh, kind of percolating in the background, but really we're, we're, we're presented with this, this uh, kind of spindled uh, aggregates, uh, cohesive aggregates of spindled cells. And um, it's not as tightly uh, cohesive as what we would expect for a granuloma. Um, and uh, the nuclear chromatin is a little difficult to appreciate, again, on an air dry diff quick smear, but, you know, it, it does have a little bit of that finely granular uh, appearance uh, without prominent nucleoli. And so if you were to tell me this is more of a lung mass, um, you know, the first thing I would think about, you know, well, could this be, you know, a, a spindle cell carcinoid tumor? But again, knowing that we're in the anterior mediastinum, here, you know, these, these findings are a little bit more classic for, uh, you know, a type A thymoma, the spindle cell type thymoma um, uh, here. And so location really is important. Obviously, we could do stains to confirm, uh, but based just on the cytomorphology, you know, that's, that's the differential that I would have here um, uh, uh, based on these findings. So a thymectomy was again performed, and I would just say that I think that there's uh, some clinical scenarios where a, a pre-surgical biopsy is obtained, um, and there's others where we typically will see the patient uh, where there's a suspected thymoma go straight to surgery, and so um, you know, we're making a de novo uh, diagnosis, say, in the frozen section room or, or um, 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 on those permanent sections from that thymectomy specimen. Um, I wanted to show the background thymus in this case as a contrast to the last case. Now, this patient is older. She's 75, um, as opposed to the 55-year-old that we had previously. And we know we have kind of ongoing regression of the thymus over, over, the, over time. But this is a much more representative uh, thymic uh, specimen from an older adult than that prior case. So this looks like fairly conventional residual atrophic thymus in, uh, in an older adult. You can see it's almost all fat with these just very small islands of residual thymus um, scattered throughout. Um, and then this is the, uh, the lesion that was resected. And um, you can see again that it's a, uh, a very hypercellular lesion. Again, it's very well circumscribed. It lacks that really kind of pronounced fibrous um, septal, septae and lobulation that we saw in the, the B2 thymoma um, in the last case. The other thing that's interesting about this is you can see it actually is um, uh, creating these uh, kind of cystic spaces around it. There's sort of a cystic degeneration that's occurring within the lesion and then um, a, a bit of a, a cystic um, uh, uh, opening between the, the, the capsule um, of the lesion and, uh, and the tumor cells themselves. And then again, you can see there's some uh, normal thymus in the background. And then on higher power, um, again, similar to what you saw in cytology, it's a uh, predominantly spindled uh, 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 neoplasm, relatively monomorphic, low-grade cytology. Um, nucleoli are, are present. They're, they're not uh, particularly prominent. Um, there's a 
moderate amounts of, uh, or you know, small to moderate amount of, of paleo eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, and again, you can see that there's this kind of cystic degenerative process that's happening um, in this uh, in this lesion. Uh, the one feature I would point out that's um, really in contrast to what we saw with our last thymoma is that it it has very very few uh, lymphocytes. Uh, obscuring the the the, um, uh, the epithelial cells, and this is again what you'd expect to see in a type A thymoma, where you would again have more of a spindled morphology of the epithelial cells, and you tend to lack those uh, abundant TDT positive immature T cells that you see in a type B thymoma. Um, type A thymoma thymomas can be quite diverse in their histologic appearance, so some will have a bit more of a spindled appearance. Some can have a more spindled appearance than this, and others can be quite epithelioid. Um, and this um, uh, type of kind of variation in the architecture um, of, the, of the tumor cells and the way they organize themselves can, can vary as well. Um, again, this is something that would mark with, with keratins. Um, uh, it can uh, mark uh, nicely with things like Pax8 and Pax1, um, as well as um, uh, with uh, P P63 or P40. So the final diagnosis, again, is a type A thymoma. Um, and then I think this brings us to our final mediastinal mass. Back to Mark. Yeah, so here we have now a young patient, an 18-year-old woman, um, who, again, was presenting symptomatic. So reminding us more back to those earlier cases. So this um, patient presented with chest pain and syncope. And here we show, uh, we've got another anterior mediastinal mass. You can see uh, the classic hilum overlay sign on the frontal view where you can see the hilar vessels through it. And on the lateral view, we see filling in of the retrosternal clear space. And actually this lateral radiograph also, if you uh, look very carefully in the center of that lesion, you can see a little bit of somewhat kind of layer or coarse calcifications there. Um, and so we went to CT. We'll see a nice correlate for those. So here we have an anterior mediastinal mass. Um, it's composed of three um, soft tissue, three uh, tissue densities. We've got the macroscopic fat. Uh, we have sort of, or I should say, even four densities. There's some macroscopic fat, uh, which Lynette is pointing out there. There's some soft tissue in the center of the lesion. We have some kind of lower attenuation areas um, where, which are probably some interspersed fluid, and then we have some nice coarse calcifications, uh, like is nicely shown on that second image. Um, so this is pretty diagnostic of a teratoma. Um, you know, certainly the more soft tissue on imaging that we see in a teratoma, the more we have to think about, is there some kind of malignant degeneration going on with it? Um, but, you know, in, a, in one where there's a lot of fluid and calcification and fat, uh, it tends to be more along the just benign spectrum. And um, had to show this case in part because it's such a gorgeous, um, gross photograph that was obtained. Um, and we were discussing this case earlier. It's it's what, what people can refer to as kind of a, a head cheese appearance with this modeled um, uh, combination of, of, of different uh, materials uh, filling these cystic spaces. So we have um, sebaceous material and cartilaginous material um, and, uh, and fat uh, and fibrous tissue, et cetera. So really a very remarkable um, gross appearance. And as you can see, it's, it's really uh, very nicely well circumscribed um, and, and certainly would, would fit with a radiographic appearance of uh, a benign uh, a teratoma. Um, and then of course on higher power image, you can see that admixture of different mature structures. Um, there's our uh, admixed fat, there's some cartilage, um, and you can see these epithelial line spaces, uh, which on higher power show beautiful uh, ciliated respiratory epithelium. And again, of course, is our, our cartilage. And then there's um, the sort of seromucinous glands associated with that. Um, and then in other areas, the kind of classic um, keratinizing uh, areas. And of course, as you probably appreciate it from the gross image areas where there's uh, hair production as well. So uh, just a really classic uh, example of a mediastinal teratoma. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the lung, um, and so there's uh, kind of a two, par two parts uh, in terms of describing the differential diagnosis of, of, of lung masses um, where we want to rule out uh, malignancy, um, and so for the first part, uh, we'll go ahead and pass it over to Mark again. Right, so here we have a 49-year-old woman with a history of uh, lupus, uh, and she, uh, I'm not sure exactly why, but she got uh, a CAT scan which showed a lung nodule. 
Um, so here on that left panel, I'm showing uh, the CT image of the lung nodule, um, which has some kind of speculations, or maybe there's small nodules, like sort of satellite nodules around the main lesion. A little bit difficult to decide exactly if those are true speculations. Um, and she then underwent a, a FTG PET scan to uh, potentially stage what might be a lung cancer. And we can see on the PET that the nodule on the middle panel there, I'm not showing it in lung windows, but you can see that there's FTG uptake associated with the nodule in the right lung. But the images also show relatively symmetric mediastinal and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, also in the supraclavicular station. Um, and I didn't show, but there was also some lymphadenopathy in the upper abdomen. Um, so radiologically, when we encounter a symmetric lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum and hyla, we tend to think about sarcoidosis. Um, and it's always a challenge then to decide, okay, in a patient who has a nodule and these findings, is it a lung cancer with sarcoidosis or sarcoid-like reaction? Or is this all sarcoidosis? Is this lung nodule also representing sarcoidosis? Um, obviously, if the lung findings were symmetric and bilateral, there wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be tricky, but in this case, we had only a single lung nodule, um, and that's why it went to uh, a tissue sampling. Yeah, and um, uh, so, so what we have here is uh, bronchoscopic sampling, both of the lymph nodes, but also of the lung mass. And so, you know, in the, the lymph node shown here, you can see the, the background of, of scattered small lymphocytes. And so, you know, cytologically, it's, it's good. We feel good that we have evidence of lymph node sampling. And we, but then in addition to that background of, of kind of polymorphous lymphocytes, we do see the somewhat cohesive aggregates of spindle to epithelioid cells um, uh, with some associated lymphocytes. And uh, on higher power in the upper right-hand corner, again, of this uh, alcohol-fixed Papanikolaou stain preparation, you can see the, 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 the open chromatin of these uh, somewhat boomerang-shaped uh, nuclei, uh, uh, oval to boomerang-shaped. And so really nice examples of granulomas, right? So the non-necrotizing granulomas or sarcoidal type granulomas we see on cytology tend not to be as uh, round uh, cannibal-like like as we encounter on, uh, on histologic uh, spe uh, uh, biopsies or resection specimens. Um, here it does illustrate a little bit more of a fraying of those, uh, uh, fraying of the histiocytes um, off of the edge. Um, and so, again, the morphology is just a very, a little bit different, but no real central necrosis. And then if we look on the next slide, um, uh, sampling uh, both, again, of the lymph nodes, but also of the lung mass itself, here on the cytology cell block, um, you have a little bit more of that familiar look to those sarcoidal type, well-formed, non-necrotizing granulomas with a, 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 a nice peripheral, a periphery of lymphocytes. Oftentimes there's a degree of fibrous uh, fibrosis and uh, almost onion skinning that we see in those granulomas. Um, importantly, both in the lymph node samples as well as in the lung sample, we did not see any evidence of uh, malignancy. So, um, you know, that really does make a sarcoidal type tissue reaction secondary to uh, malignancy, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, much less likely. Um, uh, again, going back to the radiographic appearance, it's it's n good to know, you know, that the finding of the symmetric pedavid lymphadenopathy and that, you know, sarcoid certainly could be on the differential. And so, so here cytology can very much rule in, you know, that possibility. Um, uh, and again, the pertinent negative finding is that we're not seeing ed any evidence of a non-small cell lung cancer or any other evidence of malignancy here. Um, the, the patient actually, um, I think because of the concern about the, um, the dominant lung mass, uh, did actually go for surgical resection as well as lymph node dissection. Um, and uh, this is the uh, a low power uh, view of her lung mass. And I think, you know, very much as you saw with both the radiology and the cytology, it really fits nicely with, with both of those things. Um, there's that dominant mass, then with these, these nodules that are spilling off around the edge of it, probably conferring that more spiculated appearance on the CT scan. Um, and, and you can see that the, the um, uh, lobulated um, uh, appearance here, more pale center, and then rim, rims of, of lymphocytes certainly fits with that granulomatous appearance that we saw on the, um, the cytology cell block preparations. 
uh, I would point out that there's a, a fairly distinctive bronchocentric and uh, lymphangitic distribution of, um, um, of this process. And I'll zoom in uh, specifically to this particular focus. Uh, so you can see that uh, as is typical, these um, granulomas will typically um, uh, abut up against and uh, potentially obliterate uh, your bron bron uh, bronchial structures. Uh, you can see this is uh, compressing a vascular structure here. Um, the fact that we often see these granulomas abutting up against the airways so intimately means that uh, for at least more proximal disease, um, uh, a, a transbronchial biopsy tends to be very high yield for uh, capture of, um, of granulomas. Now, what was sort of interesting in this case uh, is when we also looked at, oh, sorry, just quickly higher power view. So just you can see those um, really beautiful uh, giant cells and uh, this epithelial granuloma uh, with that cup of, of lymphocytes um, and, and sort of the beginnings of some uh, fibrous tissue being laid down um, around, uh, around these, uh, these uh, uh, granulomas. Um, and uh, what I was about to say is that interestingly in the background, um, this patient had really pronounced uh, lymphadenopathy as was highlighted by the, um, uh, the imaging. And um, at low power, you can again see the residual lymphoid uh, tissue for these nodes here. Um, you can appreciate the um, uh, ovoid and uh, round shaped uh, uh, granulomas that are displacing uh, the, um, the lymphoid tissue. I, I would say at low power, you glance at this and you say, these nodes must be filled with necrotic uh, material. Is this an infectious process? Um, looking at it at higher power, however, you can see it's actually just uh, dense hyalinization. So um, there was actually no necrosis in this case. It this was just extraordinarily hyalinized um, uh, granulomatous inflammation and, and likely on uh, kind of the, the, the later end of evolution of the sarcoidal uh, process in, um, in these mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, so uh, the diagnosis in this case, we had a, a large number of mediastinal lymph nodes that were uh, uh, obtained actually, all called hyalinized non-necrotizing granulomas. We did perform uh, special stains for organisms uh, and did not see any, not surprisingly, given how hyalinized the, uh, the nodes were. Um, and then again, I'm highlighting the fact that in, in the lung, we'll tend to see this granulomatous inflammation in a, in a, a large lymphangitic type of distribution. So around the bronchovascular bundles and the septal structures in the subpleura, um, of, the, of the lung tissue. Um, and in this particular context, the uh, morphologic features and distribution is, is compatible with sarcoidosis. And of course, that's a diagnosis of exclusion. When we render that diagnosis, we really kind of kick it back into the clinician's uh, court to um, clinically exclude anything else that could lead to a sarcoidal type reaction as Paul alluded to underlying malignancies, including solid tumors, uh, lymphomas uh, can trigger uh, an immune response, a sarcoidal type immune response. Um, and that can be the sort of presenting feature of somebody who ultimately is going to evolve a clinically recognized malignancy. Also, we, we can see sarcoidosis uh, occurring in patients who are receiving specific types of therapy. I would say in particular, um, uh, in today's um, um, uh, oncologic treatment space where immunotherapy is a, a really kind of a uh, a, a central tenet of, of treatment for many of, of our um, solid tumors, um, we will see sarcoidal type of responses to immunotherapy in a subset of patients. So it's important to keep that in mind if a patient has a history of malignancy and is getting treated, the development of new masses can actually represent an inflammatory response in the form of a sarcoidal response as opposed to recurrence of, of, uh, of tumor. Okay, our next case, back to Mark. All right, so here we have an 81-year-old woman um, who uh, had multiple myeloma, was being treated, um, and was getting sequential skeletal surveys for follow-up for myeloma. And you can see on this chest radiograph, which demonstrates kind of a large, somewhat almost speculated, uh, you know, opacity in the right lower lung zone. So this was evaluated with CT, which on the middle panel shows essentially a mass in the right lower lobe. Um, and you can see in the um, adjacent panels that there's some additional nodules above and below the mass, um, yeah, like there, for example, and down there, yeah. So um, our, you know, initial suspicion radiologically, this is a lung cancer, maybe with intralobar metastases, 
Um, and so this patient underwent uh, tissue sampling. Yeah, and so um, uh, again, coming back to a common theme, uh, bronchoscopic um, uh, sampling of, of lung lesions is a very common way that we ha evaluate uh, lung processes these days. And so here I'm showing images from the BAL, so the bronchial alveolar lavage, which um, oftentimes the bronchoscopists, when they're down there, they'll do a BAL, uh, which is very helpful to, to rule out infection, you know, for samples for microbiology, but also to evaluate cytologically in addition to any transbronchial biopsies or needle aspirations. And so kind of the multimodality sampling of lung lesions is something that um, uh, is, is at least very, very prominent in our, in our practice here in Boston. Um, and so here uh, we, we can see that from the cellular element, we have a number of uh, foamy uh, pulmonary macrophages with, with the delicate uh, kind of foamy cytoplasm, but really um, beautiful examples of these um, these uh, spherical, uh, ovoid to spherical structures that are about the same size as a red blood cell. So kind of right in the center of the screen, you can see that there is a, a red blood cell, a little bit of the heme pigment is still in there. And so, um, so we have these, these structures that also tend to have a, kind of a zone of exclusion around them on this alcohol fixed papin stain. So kind of nicely highlighting a potential capsule. On higher power, um, we can see that we have these encapsulated budding yeast forms and, and just a very, very nice um, uh, example of narrow-based budding yeast. Um, on the next slide, so looking at all the different prep, uh, 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 preps from this uh, BAL, so here we see an, an air-dried uh, uh, Reichem sustained direct smear. And once again, those encapsulated budding yeast forms tend to have a negative image or a zone of exclusion of that, um, that uh, Reichem sustaining around them, which again is very, very useful. Um, on the right-hand side, um, this is uh, an H&E stain from the cell block, again, showing that uh, more purplish hue to the, to the uh, yeast form itself. And then the capsule tends to have a little bit more of like a fuzzy pink a halo around it. So dealing with encapsulated budding yeast forms. And then I think on the next slide, we have some other stains that can be helpful for characteriz characterizing these, these uh, forms. So when dealing with fungal infections, size really is important. And so I always try to look for that measuring stick. So what that red blood cell, which we know is about seven to eight microns in size. And so when we have these budding yeast forms that are about that, that size, you know, six to, to 12 microns typically, um, that is really nicely in the cryptococcus range. Um, narrow based budding yeast forms that are like one to five microns, we could think about histoplasmosis. And then larger, um, uh, kind of eight to 20 micron uh, budding yeast forms, but with broad based budding, we could think more about blasto, uh, blastomycosis. And so size is important. Cryptococcus tends to have a nice, thick, mucy positive capsule, which we can see here. Um, I, I must admit the mucy carmine stain in our laboratory is not the best. It leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, and so, uh, but you still can't see that kind of bright, vibrant pink uh, capsule around some of those, uh, those uh, uh, encapsulated budding yeast organisms. Now, um, we do, there is a capsule deficient cryptococcus, um, in which case we can use a Fontana Masson stain, which is shown on the right hand side, which highlights that melanin like pigment uh, in the cell wall of uh, cryptococcus. And so, um, if you have Fontana Masson positivity, if you have the, the Mucy Carmen positivity with narrow base budding yeast forms, you know, in that right size range, you, you uh, can be pretty confident on the cytology or even on histology that you're dealing with um, cryptococcus here. And um, as, as Paul alluded to, we often have multimodal strategies for making diagnoses in these cases. And we have a core biopsy as well, which you can see um, is uh, quite inflamed uh, and shows some granulomatous um, uh, formation. Um, this essentially has, uh, you know, this, this biopsy has really kind of hit the, hit the lesion, I think, kind of squarely in, in the middle. It's a really nice representation of this inflammatory process. Um, and so if we zoom in, uh, you can see that even on this uh, H&E preparation, we've got a beautiful giant cell and you can see these, uh, these inclusions with, within it that have that um, almost refractile um, uh, spherical um, structures uh, scattered throughout there. You can see them beautifully here as well. 
um, largely within uh, the Histia sites that are a little bit more loosely aggregated um, in this particular uh, region. So um, uh, these, these, I think we looked at a lot of beautiful special stains from Paul already. I, I would say from the tissue uh, standpoint, at least in our laboratory, we tend to rely pretty heavily on methanamine silver stain uh, to highlight the organisms. This is actually just a, a nice representative image from pathology outlines. Um, and then again, um, an image of a mucicarmin stain, I would say, as, as Paul described, our mucicarmin is sort of like his, it's a little bit on the weak side. I think these are very nice images, again, taken from pathology outlines that can highlight um, that, that thick um, uh, mucin uh, uh, capsule of these organisms. Um, I, you know, for, for us in the Northeast of the United States, uh, we certainly see uh, cryptococcus, uh, it's probably a combination of neoformans and cryptococcus gadii. Um, uh, and as, as Paul alluded to, uh, histoplasmosis is, is um, very common uh, here in the Northeast. The, um, um, the, 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 the sort of old farmhouses of, of New England will have, have bats living in them, can um, have a, a very high levels of, of uh, histoplasmosis. Um, uh, other areas of the country here in the United States will have different endemic fun fungi. And then, of course, um, in, in your region of the world, uh, we can certainly see a very, very different set um, of organisms as well. But, uh, but Cryptococcus um, uh, can, uh, re has really been a, a very kind of ubiquitous organism that, that can, be seen, um, can be seen globally. Um, and the diagnosis, of course, in this case was um, uh, Cryptococcus in the background of acute and uh, granulomous inflammation. Of course, importantly, uh, there was no evidence of malignancy um, in this particular uh, biopsy. And we'll see cryptococcus uh, both in immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients. I think, you know, and Mark, remind me in this particular case, I, I think this individual, despite her history of myeloma, had relatively well controlled disease and was not overtly immune suppressed, um, although potentially her uh, uh, capacity to kind of keep these types of infections at bay was somewhat limited by her, her, her prior medical history. Yeah, Okay, so the next case, uh, back to you, Mark. All right, <clears throat> so now we are kind of uh, going a little bit farther down the path of immunocompromised, and we have a 64-year-old woman, status with bilateral lung transplantation three years prior. So again, you know, sort of moderately immunocompromised, I guess, the patients are on, uh, you know, um, uh, therapy to prevent rejection. Um, and a nodule was found in the left lower lobe. I believe, if I remember, it had actually grown um, over a short interval follow-up scan. Uh, PET scan was done also showing that there's kind of modest FTG uptake. Um, and so, you know, in this scenario, we certainly can see lung cancer develop in these patients. Remember that they are immunocompromised um, and so are, you know, at increased risk of, of cancer developing. Um, and we certainly also see infections like the example of cryptococcus. So um, these patients, they frequently will go to biopsy to, you know, decide what to do. Yeah, and here on the, uh, the cytologic uh, uh, needle aspiration of this mass, uh, here um, showing an example of a necrotizing granuloma, which I, in all honesty, so this is an alcohol fixed Papanicolaou stain preparation. Um, I think ne appreciating necrotizing granulomas is a little bit more difficult on cytologic preparations. Um, here, I think that you can appreciate on the left hand side of that granuloma, it's a little um, less dense. Uh, it has a little bit more of a kind of yellow orange hue, you know, in the in the center um, uh, uh, with fewer epithelioid histiocytes. And then you have a little bit of clinging, um, almost it looks like fibrinous debris, but that clinging necrosis on the side. And so um, whenever we see granulomas in any cytologic specimen, uh, cy cytology specimen or, or search path specimen, uh, whenever you see granulomas, you need to rule out the possibility of an infectious process. Um, in the absence of necrosis, an infection is less likely, but certainly not impossible. But when you see necrotizing granuloma, it is uh, really number one, number two, number three on my differential is always infection. And so you really have to do your due diligence looking for um, uh, fungus, mycobacteria, um, uh, and other uh, uh, microorganisms, as, microorganisms as well. Um, here, I, I really honed in just on the necrotizing granuloma. Uh, 
But in general, on smears, you can tend to see maybe a dirtier background, again, with maybe a fibrinous debris and uh, maybe some other inflammatory cells in the background in an infectious process leading to necrotizing granulomas. Uh, but again, uh, looking at the quality of the, 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 looking at the center of those granulomas, and if it looks a little bit uh, less cohesive, uh, a little bit more posicellular, that on cytology can give you a hint that you're looking at a necrotizing granuloma. Um, and in this particular case, um, uh, in large part, again, because of a concern around a potential for uh, malignancy, a resection specimen was actually obtained. So it gives us a nice opportunity to see this, this process um, in, the, in the tissue. Um, you can see a somewhat irregular border. Again, uh, there's a sort of a spilling out of this nodular inflammatory process around the edges. Uh, and then you can see up here at the top that there's an area where it's it's beginning to cavitate and you see a very uh, much more kind of hyperchromatic area of, of cellular debris. Um, and if we zoom in there, um, you can again see that it's it's largely lost cellular definition. It's it's an area of, of frank necrosis. I would say in a, in a context like this, our differential diagnosis might include a vasculitis because of the kind of basophilic nature. Um, of the necrosis in this case, but of course, we're concerned about infection in particular given her um, history of immunosuppression. Um, uh, I would also point out it's, it's, there, it's a very destructive process, so it can be difficult to discern where this process initiated. Uh, oftentimes, we will see the remnants of a bronchial wall. Um, uh, typically, the uh, uh, chronic infections, particularly due to um, fungal um, organisms or mycobacterial organisms can um, set up shop in a, a, a bronchiectatic, a dilated airway, and then um, kind of lead to a progressive further dilatation and destruction and inflammation around that airway. We often can see the residual um, uh, structures in, uh, in lesions like this. Um, and then uh, around the uh, adjacent um, lung parenchyma, so kind of away from that necrotic uh, component, but in the adjacent alveolated lung, uh, you can see evidence of some organization with fibroblastic proliferation and these, these um, uh, kind of loose aggregates of fibrin that are uh, somewhat form, uh, formed to the, um, the structures of those alveolated spaces. And so, um, we've seen this type of pattern of injury be, ca be called acute fibrinous and organizing pneumonia. Um, I think that the field has moved away from placing that as a kind of diagnostic label on lung biopsy specimens because it's a, it's a fairly nonspecific reaction that simply points to a, um, a, a prior or ongoing acute lung injury and we're in the process of organizing. Um, we see this type of, of change, this uh, AFOC, if you will, type of uh, background change and in infections uh, very commonly. Um, and then in this particular case, when an AFB stain was performed on, um, on the, the tissue, uh, we see a really beautiful example of um, acid fast psilli. Um, I would say this is probably one of the better looking <laughs> AFB stains that I've seen in a while. This is actually courtesy of, of Paul. Um, uh, the the uh, AFB stain we had available um, from the surgical specimen for, for this patient was much, was much dimmer. It's often can be quite uh, difficult to kind of get exactly the right balance of contrast for, for a really beautiful AFB stain in, in uh, surgical tissues. We'll often do a combination of stains to increase our sensitivity of detection of these organisms because they can be very um, sparse as well in the tissue. Uh, we'll, we'll often perform a modified AFB that um, is modified to enhance detection of nocardia organisms, but also can enhance the detection of, of acid fast bacilli like mycobacteria. Um, and um, we'll, we, we have a mycobacterial immunohistochemistry stain that's quite nice. It uses a red reaction uh, product for the chromogen which really enhances that contrast between um, the hematoxylin um, counter stain and uh, new organisms when they're present. The, the challenge with the mycobacterial IHC is that it's not 100% specific for mycobacterium. It can detect some fungal species, including candida, and it also can detect nocardia species. So it's a really nice screening tool, which we'll then use to kind of kick over to look at um, our, our more conventional um, uh, histochemical stains, um, such as our AFB stain. Uh, 
So um, uh, this particular uh, patient um, uh, was diagnosed with a necrotizing pneumonia containing abundant acid fast bacilli consistent with mycobacterial infection. Speciating those uh, organisms on the surgical specimen is pretty much impossible. Um, so we have to uh, rely on uh, lab the laboratory, the uh, microbiology laboratory, ideally if, if they're able to get uh, tissue uh, sent directly from the surgical reception specimen, they can culture it from, from that, which is what happened here. A uh, remarkably short period of time, uh, we, had a, we had an identification within nine days of mycobacterium avium. Um, oftentimes, uh, we may not get material, adequate material sent for culture, um, or it, it just takes a very long time to grow. Um, we will send tissue from the, the tissue blocks, from the fixed tissue blocks for PCR for uh, mycobacterial identification. There's a couple of labs uh, around the country and the U.S. that um, have the facilities to do that. Um, it, it works um, a subset of the time. I would say sometimes it, um, that approach cannot detect the mycobacterial organisms, even though we can see them in the tissue. Uh, but if they're very, very sparse, if you only see, say, two or three in a, a, a large area of necrosis, often that's insufficient material for you to actually amplify it up for um, speciation by PCR. Um, so again, a multimodal approach to actually get to a final diagnosis in this case. OK, back to Mark. All right, so um, we have another patient here, uh, post-lung transplant um, surveillance imaging. Um, and this patient actually presented with hemoptysis, and it was a relatively recent transplant, in this case only two months prior, uh, in comparison to the earlier case where it was three years prior. Um, so this patient presented with hemoptysis and had some imaging, uh, which shows a large area of consolidation in the right upper lobe. Um, and there's actually kind of a ground glass halo around this consolidation, which led to our initial suspicion that this might represent uh, an angioinvasive fungal pneumonia. Um, but subsequent imaging, uh, in part due to results from pathology, demonstrated that uh, we actually have absence of the right-sided pulmonary veins, although the right pulmonary arteries are all patent. Uh, we do not see the right-sided pulmonary veins at all. Yeah, and so um, when being presented, you know, on cytology with these types of um, somewhat ill-defined um, mixed uh, ground glass, solid lung lesions that, you know, doesn't really scream, uh, you know, primary malignancy, you know, there's a number of different things that we can see. And it's actually, in, in my, my experience, pretty difficult to make a definitive diagnosis purely on cytology for a couple of these entities. And so, you know, first thing is organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia, extremely common uh, seen either, you know, cop in, in more of an idiopathic or, you know, an infectious or inflammatory uh, etiology. On cytology, you know, certainly on, on BALs, but also on needle aspirations, we tend to see something like this. So on this alcohol fix, uh, papanicolaou stained uh, preparations, uh, background fibrinous debris, maybe some hemocytic macrophages, on the right-hand side, you can see kind of mixed inflammatory cells, some neutrophils, some lymphocytes, some histiocytes, and some granular debris. That's about it. Um, uh, next slide, we we can sometimes see, again, hemocytin-laden macrophages, right, if there has been some bleeding going on. And, and again, on the right-hand right panel, maybe a little bit of fibrinomucinous debris in the background. So what's notably absent is we really don't see those nice Masson bodies all that frequently or those, you know, those those uh, fibroblastic proliferations in the alveolar spaces. Um, on cytology, we tend to get more of the cellular or the um, non-cellular elements sampled there. So if we go to the next slide, as alluded to, um, so in that middle panel, you know, that nice, uh, you know, uh, loose fibromyxoid uh, stroma in the alveolar spaces, for whatever reason, that is not often sampled on a needle aspiration, and rather you get the inflammatory uh, milieu in the background. On the uh, on the the leftmost panel, again, this is a nice example of of something that Lynette showed earlier. A little bit more of like a a, 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 a fibrinous kind of an acute fibrinous and organizing pneumonia. Here we have a little bit more fibrin in inflammatory cells. Um, that again, you can see those components, but not in in kind of that solid. Um, cohesive look that we have on histopathology. And then lastly, from a cellular standpoint, so here I'm showing you a, a, a small cluster of reactive pneumocytes that certainly can look quite scary um, uh, 
uh, from a cytologic standpoint, you know, has big prominent nucleoli, open chromatin, certainly can be a mimic for a lung adenocarcinoma. But some of the clues are, number one, you know, the, what, what are you seeing in the background? Are you seeing an inflammatory background? Um, if so, you don't want to necessarily overinterpret um, these type of cells. And then number two is, how frequently are you encountering these? Um, in general, if you stick a needle into uh, an adenocarcinoma, you should get out a lot of cells. But in the situation of reactive pneumocytes, you tend to only have maybe one or two clusters of these types of cells. It's relatively a posse cellular um, a sampling. And so if you only have a few groups of, of, of atypical pneumocytes like this, hold back on pulling the trigger of, of saying, you know, uh, uh, favoring an adenocarcinoma, but rather more of a reactive cellular process here. Um, and then last slide, um, uh, so sometimes uh, if you have just these fragments of posse cellular hyalinized collagen, collagenized material, um, it could give the impression, you know, could this be necrosis? Is this just um, fibrosis? You know, that can be difficult to put into context. Um, again, sometimes you could do some stains to help out. Um, so if you were to do a trichrome stain in this instance, you know, it would light up very blue, again, highlighting that dense hyalinized collagen uh, nature of this stromal fragment, which would be different from necrosis uh, or, or more dense fibrinous debris, which would color red on the Massance trichrome stain. And once again, in the setting of pulmonary infarction, having reactive pneumocytes is a very common finding. Again, usually you don't see too many groups, but um, again, knowing the context in which you're getting these cytology specimens can be very important to to uh, uh, to kind of adjust your pretest probability if you're dealing with malignancy versus a reactive process, um, especially in a small limited sample. Um, and a core biopsy was obtained in this case uh, as well as as Mark alluded to earlier. It began to inform some of the radiographic um, interpretations. Um, and this is a low power view of uh, of a core biopsy. And I'll, I'll I'll zoom into this. I would point out that you know most of what we're seeing in the middle of this core biopsy is is dead lung. So this is uh, this is uh, ischemic or infarcted lung tissue. Um, but if we zoom into that uh, one uh, edge, you can see um, uh, the the contours of a vascular structure. And the lumen of that vascular structure has been uh, almost completely um, filled by uh, this sort of fib fibro um, fibroblast proliferation, uh, some inflammatory cells, and a little bit of recanalization. And so this would certainly point to um, a, a, some kind of, of obstructive, uh, either embolic or um, uh, kind of in situ um, thrombosis uh, within, this, within this vascular structure. Um, uh, kind of, again, zooming in a little bit more, this is uh, the area of uh, infarcted lung. Um, you can still appreciate the underlying um, architecture, the underlying alveolar, alveolar, um, alveolated spaces and, um, uh, and vascular structures, but uh, it's really been overcome by, uh, by hemorrhage um, and some inflammatory cells. Um, and then over on the, um, the far left, you can see um, a little bit more of an organizing appearance to it, a little bit of reactive changes in the pneumocyte uh, population uh, that on higher power, uh, again, you can see a little bit of a thickening of the interstitial structures, um, uh, uh, some uh, foamy macrophages, some foamy changes in the pneumocytes as well. And again, a little bit of organization in the, in the fibroblast uh, uh, and this sort of that mixed area. Of, um, of fibrinous uh, debris that's probably just on the edge of, of an area of infarction in the, in the lung. Um, so um, in the end, this was descriptively signed out um, as lung tissue with acute injury and necrosis and hemorrhage, uh, as well as that associated organizing to organize um, thrombi or thromboemboli um, uh, within that, um, that vascular structure consistent with a pulmonary infarct. And, and this was also stained for organisms and was negative. Um, and I think we, 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 to some extent, need to rely on our radiology colleagues to point more to where, where they think the source of the, of the infarct is. And I would let you um, maybe touch on that a little bit more, Mark, in terms of, of defining it as more of an arterial versus a venous infarct. Right. In this case, it was um, a venous infarction due presumably to kind of insectual thrombosis at the venous anastomosis. Um, and venous infarcts in the lung, I guess we could say also like in the brain, although it's a different topic, um, tend to look a little funny. They, they don't have the typical 
you know, wedge shaped peripheral nature, or they don't always, they can, but they don't always have that nature, which would really help let us suggest that as the initial diagnosis. But in this case, you know, it was a little bit more central, very dense area of consolidation. And the, the ground glass surrounding it was presumably some hemorrhage kind of around the periphery of this infarction. Um, and so venous infarcts are very difficult to diagnose prospectively without contrast. Um, on the basis of this pathologic diagnosis, the CT angiogram that, uh, that we showed was then performed, showing that with complete absence of the pulmonary veins on that side, um, which then were embarked, um, which is an unfortunate uh, outcome for this lung transplant patient, um, although, um, although the other lung was still viable. Right. Thanks for that uh, discussion. Okay, we'll move on to the, the next um, uh, batch of lung masses where we're gonna be ruling out malignancy. So part two, and uh, again, handing it back over to Mark. Right, so uh, a more typical sort of uh, scenario here. Uh, we've got a lot of oddball cases and now we're, I think, going back to the more common thing. So we've got a 59-year-old man uh, with abnormal chest radiograph. This guy was actually a non-smoker. Um, and uh, I don't have the original chest radiograph, but we have the CT that was performed, um, and it shows bilateral nodules and masses, some of them kind of consolidated in appearance with their bronchograms, such as in the right lower lobe there. Um, and on the third panel, I'm showing that there was some subcarinal and left hyder lymphadenopathy as well. So, you know, the setting of bilateral irregular masses and lymphadenopathy, um, certainly in the appropriate context, it doesn't look like this here, but in the appropriate context, you might think about sarcoid like one of our earlier cases. Um, but, you know, common things being common, bilateral lung nodules and masses, we got to think about malignancy, um, you know, particularly primary lung cancer if the, if the masses are, you know, large. Yeah, so if we start to think about um, uh, uh, malignancy uh, in the lung, um, uh, thinking about lung primaries first, um, uh, there, there certainly can be cytologic clues that can point us towards uh, adenocarcinoma, you know, adenocarcinoma being the most common uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, at least in the United States, accounting for about 46% of all uh, lung cancers, uh, squamous cell carcinoma accounting for about 22%. Um, and then, you know, in contrast to uh, some of the other tumor types, you know, small cell being about 10%. Um, Though that being said, sometimes on cytology, you can clearly say it's malignant, as I have some examples here. So on the left-hand side, so this is a, an alcohol-fixed papanicolaou stain where we have really, really ugly tumor cells, you know, pretty dramatic anisonucleosis, um, variable nuclei, some with single prominent nucleoli, some with multiple uh, nucleoli. You have a little, maybe a little bit of a hint of, of a bit more delicate cytoplasm that might make you lean towards a uh, an adenocarcinoma. But on the other hand, you know, this could very well be a, a poorly differentiated non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma or even, you know, more exotic um, uh, uh, tumor types. And then on the right hand side, this is the uh, this is an uh, air dry diff quick or, or uh, right game sustained smear. Once again, showing um, uh, ugly tumor cells, no cytoplasmic keratinization and no kind of acinar formation, really anything to declare adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. And so if you have these type of, of, of cytologic specimens or small biopsy specimens where you don't have immunohistochemistry to help um, uh, point one way or another, you know, the, the recommendation is to sign these out as a non-small cell carcinoma, not otherwise specified. Again, if you are dealing with uh, presumably a lung primary. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, this is in contrast to more traditional lung adenocarcinoma morphologies. And so these are um, some, some alcohol fix, Papanicolaou stained examples of lung adenocarcinoma, which um, tends to have uh, a little bit more uh, 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 columnar shape to some of the cells. So on the left hand side, you can see we do have a little bit of columnar shape to the cells with a basally placed nucleus, um, prominent nucleoli, relatively open chromatin. And once again, a bubbly to delicate cytoplasm is a nice clue on cytologic preparations, especially alcohol fix preparations, pointing towards an adenocarcinoma line of differentiation. On the right hand side, we have a, maybe a little bit of an acinar structure um, uh, of these of these cells uh, around a, a little central cavity. So, so recapitulating a little bit of the architecture of a lung adenocarcinoma with an acinar growth pattern. 
Then on the next slide, we can look at uh, some of the other features. Uh, they tend adenocarcinomas. They tend to be pretty cellular on, on uh, needle aspirations. Here showing uh, somewhat more monotonous uh, uh, size to, the, but enlargement of the nuclei of uh, this this lung adenocarcinoma. But then again on the right hand side, a nice example of an alcohol fix Papanikolaou stain, where you have a little bit more basal placement of the nuclei, columnar. Uh, columnar shape of the cells, again, with that really nice bubbly cytoplasm. Clearly uh, an adenocarcinoma morphology there. Um, and then on the next slide, so then on the other hand, uh, side of the non-small cell carcinoma spectrum, uh, we have squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, so <laughs> keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma in cytology can be very easy. You know, one of the more easy diagnoses to make, especially if you're dealing um, with a, a Papanikolaou stain. So one of the advantages of that alcohol fix Papanikolaou stain is that cytoplasmic keratinization lights up in that bright pink to yellow orange color in the cytoplasm. In contrast to the shades of aqua blue that we see in non-keratinizing uh, cytoplasm cells. And so um, on the left-hand side, even though few in number, you can see that there are these keratinized squamous cells that really do have quite ugly nuclei. So the nuclei are hyperchromatic, um, um, uh, uh, coarse, uh, and and really too much uh, cytologic atypia that what you would expect to see in something like a squamous metaplasia or other benign keratinizing squamous process in the lung. On the right-hand side, in the lower right-hand corner, once again, we have a really ugly keratinized squamous cell with that lump of coal type uh, hyperchromatic nucleus again, surrounded by that keratinizing pink uh, irregular cytoplasm. And then in the upper right-hand corner, so this is an example of an air-dried diff-quick stain. And so the keratinized cytoplasm there has that very characteristic robin egg blue color. And so it has that, that the rim of keratinized cytoplasm in those cells has a nice robin egg blue color, which um, is a little bit more subtle compared to the Papanikolaou stain, but it is there and something that you can uh, certainly hone in on. And so um, non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas, on the other hand, as we alluded to and talked a little bit about um, in the thymic carcinoma, here usually the nuclei are round to oval with uh, multiple uh, hyperchromatic uh, chromocenters. Um, these nuclei sometimes have been described as russet potato-like, so oblong with a number of um, so-called eye spots were th representing those, uh, those chromocenters. Um, Non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas tend to have a little bit more of a necrotic, dirty background, as, as seen in this example here. Um, and then sometimes, if you're lucky, you can see a little bit of cytoplasmic uh, keratinization um, uh, with some, some pink uh, color to the cytoplasm. So, so really, in, in, in the lung cancer, uh, uh, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, or non-small cell carcinoma, NOS, are going to be the vast majority of the diagnoses that we make um, uh, cytologically for... Uh, these type of, of, of lung lesions. Of course, immunohistochemistry is very useful for definitive characterization and ruling in a lung primary adenocarcinoma versus metastases, especially for non-mucinous type adenocarcinomas. So given the radiographic appearance for our um, patients, uh, there was uh, uh, relatively limited sampling carried out um, uh, without um, really an intent to go for a surgical cure because it, it seemed pretty obvious based on the radiology that there was bilateral disease and substantial lymph node involvement. Um, and so a core biopsy was obtained just to render our diagnosis and enable um, uh, additional molecular testing to uh, guide future, uh, future therapy. Um, and so you can see on this, uh, on this core biopsy, it's a, a really very nice representative uh, biopsy. Uh, there's areas of acinar growth. Uh, we saw an example on the cytology from, from Paul a moment ago. Um, and then uh, there's other areas here that really show very classic mic micropapillary type of growth pattern. And I um, you know, just sort of a, you know, anecdotal observations, I, I, I think that we, we do tend to see a predominance of micropapillary type of growth pattern um, which is associated with much more aggressive behavior uh, in our patients uh, who have um, uh, oncogene-driven uh, adenocarcinomas, uh, which, is, which tend to be enriched in patients who are never smokers. That's not to say we don't see micropapillary in our kind of conventional smoke, uh, smoking-related adenocarcinomas, but there does seem to be a, 
uh, kind of a predominance of this type of, of pattern. And this, this pattern may also contribute to the intrapulmonary spread that we can see. And I think as, it's, as is evident in our uh, patient, um, in that these types of little nests of cells can kind of bud off from the main tumor and spread through the air spaces and um, set up a new lesion um, uh, distant to the primary tumor. So again, a, a, a pretty classic um, adenocarcinoma with astenoid micropapillary patterns, which of course, based on the radiographic imaging was, uh, was metastatic. And so this patient would go right to systemic therapy um, in, this, in this instance. Um, uh, and just for comparison, uh, I'd also show you a resection specimen from a patient with a squamous cell carcinoma, again, just sort of bread and butter uh, pathology. This is a low grade, I'm sorry, a low power image um, of a patient with a large um, sort of space occupying mass here um, in the lung. Uh, and you can see that there's a, a combination both of, of more basophilic and more eosinophilic components to this tumor. Um, and you can probably infer from that that there's at least partial characterization uh, in this particular um, instance of, uh, of, of a squamous cell carcinoma. And there, of course, the higher power, kind of a nice correlate of the uh, keratinizing cells that we saw in cytology. And you can see how these cells have a very polygonal appearance um, where they are um, uh, more intact. Um, and again, um, those um, desmosomal bridges uh, between the cells, which are, are really characteristic of squamous morphology. We often see, can see quite a bit of variable morphology in our squamous carcinomas with some showing greater clear cell appearance, such as in this area, more keratinization in others, and more basaloid appearance in, in other tumors. Um, and so that, again, of course, is a resected squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. Okay, um, next case, back to Mark. All right, so um, this is kind of an interesting case. So this is a 56-year-old woman um, who was undergoing a next CT for uh, hyperparathyroidism, looking for a parathyroid adenoma, um, and some lung nodules were found, then prompting a full chest CT, which I'm showing you here. Um, and um, so there are two nodules in this case. One is located in the superior segment of the, of the left lower lobe, uh, and the other one is in the right middle lobe. Um, the left lower lobe nodule, it's difficult to appreciate on these single slices, but as you would scroll up and down, you can see that there's sort of a tubular component to it, suggesting that it has at least endobronchial extension. The other thing that I'm showing, and it's a bit difficult to appreciate, um, perhaps, but um, there is some, um, there are foci of air trapping here. So in the superior segment, particularly on that first image there, you can see that the lung is more lucent, is darker than uh, the adjacent lung parenchyma, or sort of near that nodule is darker than other areas. And then we have some other foci, particularly on that second image, and kind of the left upper lobe anteriorly, there's this kind of uh, triangular, yeah, exactly, area of air trapping. Um, and the other thing I'll point out is for the right middle of nodule, it's very oval or round. It's not speculated um, like we see in our, you know, sort of most common appearance of uh, primary lung cancers. So um, while difficult, I think in this case to make the diagnosis prospectively, if you see oval nodules, we tend to think about uh, a few things, metastatic disease for sure, um, if the patient has a known primary, in this case, didn't. Um, uh, carcinoid tumors, which tend to be oval and also tend to be endobronchial, of course. Um, so that would fit with the nodule in the, in the left lower lobe. Uh, and then, you know, the third thing, usually with a solitary lesion, would be like a pulmonary hematoma or something like that. Um, the presence of air trapping, um, we can see with endobronchial extension of tumors. So uh, like carcinoid uh, tumors, um, and patients may have multifocal carcinoid tumors. I think Lynette will talk about that a little bit later um, in a syndrome known as DIPNIC, D-I-P-N-E-C-H, diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. And those patients on imaging tend to have multiple pulmonary nodules and areas of air trapping uh, due to bronchial obstruction. So that's something to consider. Of course, metastatic disease can involve uh, the bronchi and can lead to air trapping as well. Um, so those are things that you might consider. Yeah, and um, uh, a really so so deep down, if, if if I were to psychoanalyze myself, I think that I want to be a radiologist on some level because I absolutely love looking at the radiology and and um, you know I say that a little tongue in cheek, but but honestly, it's so important to to look you know in in my opinion as a pathologist, a cytopathologist, to look at the the CT images yourself and to get a sense of what is the quality of that quote unquote lung nodule and is 
as, as Mark said, you know, the, the smooth contour, you know, not all lung nodules are created the same. And so if you're only relying on what's on the requisition sheet or even, you know, in, in the CT report, it's that you, you might uh, not have all the information. And so, you know, when presented with that type of picture, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the first couple things on my differential would be, you know, ca low, you know carcinoid tumor, um, per perhaps like a pulmonary hamartoma, you know, if, uh, especially if there isn't as, as much fat, uh, you know, with the smooth lobulated contours. But, you know, what's shown here, is, you know, some just classic cytomorphology of, uh, of uh, a carcinoid tumor. So on the left, we have an, an air dried uh, diff quick or right gheme sustain. And so here, nicely showing kind of that, that relatively monotonous uniform population of cells. And you can even approach, appreciate a little bit of the chromatin quality here where you don't have those big single prominent nucleoli, but you do have a little bit of granular, um, uh, granular chromatin, finely salt and pepper chromatin. Um, not seeing um, necrosis and really not seeing any appreciable mitotic figures uh, there. And then on the right-hand side, this is uh, basically the paired um, smear uh, this is the alcohol fix Papanicolaou stain, uh, which really nicely highlights more the nuclear quality and the nuclear details of that powdery, uh, finely granular uh, chromatin that we typically that we see in carcinoid tumors. Again, lack of necrosis, uh, lack of mitotic figures would really point to this being a, a more well differentiated carcinoid tumor. Um, uh, grading of carcinoid tumors, you, you know, relies on the presence or absence of necrosis plus uh, the number of mitoses per two millimeters squared on a histopathologic specimen. Really, that can be very difficult, if not impossible, to re reliably and reproducibly assess on cytology smears or thin preps or cell blocks for that matter. And so really, we're encouraged at this point in time, if we can identify it's a carcinoid tumor by morphology, by immunohistochemical staining, uh, the way that we are, are encouraged to sign these out now as carcinoid tumor not otherwise specified. Um, our, my, you know, the surgeon, sur or my, my surgical colleagues and interventional pulmonary colleagues would always come back and say, well, does it look like a typical carcinoid or an atypical carcinoid? And then we have the discussion is like, well, it probably is typical carcinoid, uh, but, you know, we would have to uh, have definitive staging, you know, based on the resection specimen. And so, you know, I try to put in as much useful information as possible in the cytology reports, you know, the um, perhaps a MIB-1 or KI-67 proliferation index and whether or not you're seeing necrosis or frequent mitoses. But once again, on small biopsy or cytology specimens, it can be very difficult to definitively grade or tease apart a typical carcinoid from atypical carcinoid tumors um, uh, on these types of preparations. So a surgical resection was carried out in this case, and as is as often the the, the case uh, for carcinoids, they will will have a very central location. Um, you can see that there's actually cartilaginous airway here. This was a very difficult surgical resection. Um, this was the segmental, um, uh, an anatomic uh, resection of a lung segment in an effort to try to uh, re um, um, re refrain from performing a full lobectomy. Um, the, the segment was, was removed, but unfortunately the tumor essentially extended to the, mar the margin of that segmental bronchus. Um, it was actually quite small, however, it was only about an eight millimeter uh, carcinoid tumor, um, which is really just over the threshold for what we would consider carcinoid tumorlet, which should be five millimeters or less. Um, so this carcinoid tumor, while small, it was you know, sort of unfortunately placed right at the edge of that segmental bronchus and it necessitated a completion lobectomy to get a completely negative margin. Um, so uh, maybe a little bit difficult from this low power to really appreciate the, um, um, the, the pathologic features of this, um, of this neoplasm. Um, as we look at it at higher power, you can see the spindle to epithelioid growth pattern, again, very monotonous appearance, salt and pepper chromatin, the lack of mitotic activity, the lack of mitosis. So indeed, on resection, um, this was uh, uh, signed out as a typical carcinoid tumor. Uh, we will specifically um, uh, call out the number of mitoses that are identified per two millimeters squared, uh, as well as the presence or absence of tumor necrosis. Um, while I didn't show you in this case, this, this particular individual also had a fair amount of neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia that was detected in the airways in the background lung, as well as multiple carcinoid tumorlets. As I mentioned, this is um, neuroendocrine cell 
proliferation that extends beyond the basement membrane um, of, uh, of an airway and is measuring less than five millimeters. Um, and when you see multiple of those features, um, typically you're going to see it in the context of somebody who's had a resection for a carcinoid tumor, as in this case, it does raise the possibility of this entity of Dipnik, which is frankly not a very well understood uh, entity, I think, uh, and Mark, I, I would have you weigh in on this because you're the one who pointed this out as a possibility. The fact that she presented with parathyroid adenomas might raise the possibility of a background genetic uh, underlying predisposition. Mark, if you wanted to comment further. Sure. I, I wanna, I'll actually make a few comments about Dipnik because I think it's, it's a confusing diagnosis and not well known and not well understood, as you said. Um, and we frequently identify it in the setting of a patient with a known carcinoid tumor, usually that is undergone resection. And on follow-up surveillance for these patients, they will see multiple pulmonary nodules. Um, and you know, I've seen some radiologists um, and even some clinicians who aren't too familiar with this diagnosis worry, are these metastases from this patient's carcinoid tumor? And the answer is no, they're not metastases. These are all separate, essentially primaries. Uh, there's sort of a field defect as it were. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. And, you know, as, on from the radiology side, we can sometimes suggest it. From the pathology side, it can be suggested. And it can really, I think, reassure the clinician when they're confronted with the nodules as they're following these patients to not start worrying, oh, you know, is this, um, you know, is this metastatic disease? Um, you know, from the clinical symptomatology, most of these patients are, I believe, really asymptomatic and it's incidental. Um, although some patients will present with asthma-like symptoms from airway obstruction. Um, so that's something just to be aware of. Um, and, and so in regards to genetic diagnoses, as far as I'm aware, um, most patients do not have a identified syndrome or genetic mutation other, uh, you know, um, just beyond dipneck. No, there's no mutation associated. There are a few patients with, particularly with the MEN, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, um, who have Dipnik, presumably then related to that syndrome, related to that mutation. Um, and I don't know that this particular patient has actually been investigated for that, but she does have a parathyroid adenoma, so you might wonder if she has one of the MEN syndromes. Um, but most patients with Dipnik do not. They're just sort of uh, sporadic. Right. Th thanks so much, uh, Mark. Yeah, it seems like it certainly warrants further follow-up in this individual to understand what the nature of, this, of her multiple uh, lesions actually is. Um, okay, we'll go on to the next uh, concept, which is uh, differentiating between primary and metastatic disease in the lung. Okay, so um, this was a 79-year-old uh, man with a known history of metastatic prostate cancer as well as um, notable marginal zone lymphoma, and this patient was getting uh, FDG PET-CT for follow-up of the lymphoma, um, and this PET-CT identified some pulmonary nodules. So we'll see here, uh, there's particularly one in the right lower lobe. Um, and this was in, I think it was initially identified as new at the time of the PET-CT and a diagnostic chest CT performed three months later showed that the nodule had grown. And there's interestingly kind of a ground glass uh, halo essentially around this nodule, um, which is interesting. I mean, as we, as I alluded to earlier, a lot of times when we see a ground glass halo, we think about hemorrhage around a lesion. Um, for example, vasculitis or infarct um, or even hemorrhagic metastases from, you know, some, you know, highly vascular tumor. Um, but sometimes uh, the ground glass can represent a mucinous component of a tumor. Um, and it's not always easy to kind of distinguish those possibilities radiologically. Obviously, um, the stability or relatively slow growth over time um, tends to suggest more something like tumor rather than hemorrhage. Um, but it's not easy to to know. Um, uh, at any rate, so the presence of this growing nodule is suspected to be a primary lung cancer prompted a biopsy. Um, and the biopsy is uh, shown here. You can see it's a, a very generous biopsy, uh, really capturing this, uh, this process very nicely. Um, in some areas, it um, is, is really just wall-to-wall um, um, -wall, uh, mucinous epithelium with a um, uh, fiber inflammatory response in the stroma. Uh, in other areas, you can see that it's, there's more preservation of the underlying lung parenchyma with, uh, with this uh, epithelium kind of stuck onto the top of that, um, of that normal um, alveolar structure. 
Um, on higher power, you can see the um, basal orientation of the, the nuclei, the apical mucin droplets, um, the relatively uh, monomorphic appearance of the, of the tumor cells. Um, there, I believe on this one, we might have a nice example. Uh, I can't see it right now, unfortunately. We do, I think, have a nice example of mitotic activity in this epithelium. Um, and again, it's just kind of sitting on top of the normal alveolated um, uh, structures of the, of the lung. Um, so when we're faced with this type of morphology um, in the lung, um, I, you know, the first thing that probably would come to mind uh, for most people would be an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, primary to the lung. Uh, obviously, in this gentleman, he had a history of prostate cancer, so we think about that. It's an awfully unusual morphology for um, not for, for prostate cancer. Um, the other other feature uh, that, or the other the other tumor that you might want to think about would be metastasis from. A, say a mucinous tumor of the pancreatic or biliary tract, particularly in a, in a male, uh, you would think about a met from, uh, from the ovary, potentially in a, in a woman. Um, the, the, the radiology on here I thought was kind of interesting in that it was a very subpleural mass. And, and, I, and I, you know, I would, I would you know, obviously defer to, to Mark's um, uh, expertise on it, but um, uh, I, you know, I think we've we've been burned, if you will, in pathology enough times where we just sort of flat-footedly will call something uh, an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, inferring that it's primary to the lung. And we discover subsequently, based on imaging um, or based on a careful review of the chart, that the patient actually has a history of pancreatic cancer, thus bringing that possibility of, of metastatic pancreatic cancer into the differential. And of course, we know that metastases can often um, land in the pleura or the subpleura or can be multifocal. And so thinking about the differential and, and paying attention to some of the radio radiographic features can be really important to raising the right type of differential um, in, um, uh, in, in a patient's uh, biopsy at the time of that initial diagnosis. Here's just another higher power image of, um, of that um, uh, mucinous epithelium. And, um, and ultimately, um, we, we did perform immunohistochemistry in this case as well, and we often will, uh, particularly again, if there's any possibility of spread from a, a, a site outside of the lung. Um, performing stains like TTF1 are frankly not particularly helpful in many cases because the biology of most primary mucinous tumors of the lung is that there's a, a, a switch off of that TTF1 expression. Uh, and pushing uh, the, the tumor more towards an enteric type phenotype. So oftentimes the, the profile of the tumor cells very uh, closely recapitulates, uh, even if it's a primary lung, it recapitulates the phenotype of something that's arising in the, um, uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, a marker that can be helpful is SMAD4 in that it is um, relatively commonly lost in pancreatic cancers, probably about 50% of the time. Um, where it's lost, whereas it's lost only maybe five to ten percent of the time in a primary um, a mucinous tumor of the lung. So it's not a hundred percent sensitive or specific, but can certainly be helpful in pointing to the possibility of a, of a, of a tumor arising from the pancreatic or biliary tract. Um, and uh, and in that particular case, we actually stated um, stated that concern explicitly in the note and and made a you know, really top line this, not to say invasive mucinous um, adenocarcinoma, which I think in our clinicians' minds immediately prompts a diagnosis of primary uh, to the lung, but stated it as it's an invasive adenocarcinoma, it has mucinous features, and please read our note uh, about our concerns about this potentially being a metastasis. Yeah, and uh, I think Lynette actually sent me a note about this case saying, can you look back? And so we actually went and looked back at the PET scan um, and in retrospect, they identify that there's FTG uptake in the pancreatic body, which is not normal. Um, we have normal uptake in the liver, spleen, and kidneys. Um, but there's FTG uptake in the pancreatic body, and this actually highlights, um, I don't know how well you can see it, Lynette, but in the tail of the pancreas, there's this photopenic tubular structure, which is the pancreatic duct, which is dilated, which should not be that large. Um, so this is, uh, you know, indeed a pancreatic primary adenocarcinoma with um, you know, the typical obstruction of the pancreatic duct uh, was unfortunately not picked up at the time, um, but yeah, it became next up. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so indeed, um, you're putting it all together. Um, this was, was ultimately clinically diagnosed as metastatic mucinous pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Um, and that leads us into uh, our next uh, discussion, 
Right, so uh, kind of companion case in a way, we have a 76 year old woman, former smoker, um, who presented to clinical attention with cough, rather sort of frothy sputum and some dyspnea. Um, and she was evaluated with, with chest radiographs that they don't have that showed persistent airspace disease. Um, she then got a chest CT, um, which shows essentially dense consolidation involving most of her right lower lobe. Um, it's a tiny bit of ground glass, but it's mostly just dense consolidation. Um, obviously, a patient comes in with cough, you know, the first time you say, well, it's probably a pneumonia. Um, but, um, you know, when patients like this have persistent consolidation over time, then we start wor worrying about, um, you know, uh, what we kind of describe as a consolidated or a mnemonic, uh, as it were, adenocarcinoma. Um, we, you know, we often, and we'll have a lot to get into this, we often think about mucinous adenocarcinomas on imaging when we see this consolidation, but in my experience, um, that's not really specific, and we do see other um, hist histopathology histologies of adenocarcinoma that produce the consolidative appearance. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, but but I think you know, suggesting adenocarcinoma in a persistent consolidation, um, you know, will lead to the correct uh, kind of workup. Um, and I guess just as a parenthetical, sometimes lymphomas can also present as persistent consolidation, but it's just much much less common than adenocarcinoma. Yeah, so from the cytology standpoint, um, the the diagnosis um, is easy, but uh, exactly as Lynette alluded to, saying exactly if this is a primary or a met to the lung is very difficult. And so, uh, you know, we just saw an example of a metastatic, uh, you know, uh, a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma to mm -hmm. the lung. Here's a cytologic example of that, uh, a, little, a little blurry, but you can see that there is, uh, number one on the left-hand side, a mucinous background. So when you see a lot of mucin, either on your smears or on, on a needle aspirate of a mass, um, uh, tend, you, you know, that's tend to be seen in mucinous adenocarcinomas. And so on the right-hand side, you can see that we have a bit of a honeycomb arrangement of, of clearly abnormal cells with somewhat prominent nucleoli um, a delicate foamy cytoplasm. And so, yeah, it looks like a mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is a mucinous lung adenocarcinoma. So an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung. And honestly, I could have, sw I could have swapped those two slides and it would have, nobody would uh, be any the wiser because once again, you know, on a needle aspiration of, of a mucinous lung adenocarcinoma, you'd expect to see a lot of mucin in the background. Uh, and then these uh, nice honeycomb arrangement of the uh, tumor cells, basally placed nuclei. The nuclei are relatively low, uh, low grade. Um, and then they have the apical uh, mucinous, uh, mucinous uh, cups uh, uh, in their cytoplasm. And so um, if you go to the next slide, um, again, another clue. So these are examples on an air dry diff quick smear. You can see a ton of mucin in the background. They tend to be pretty cellular um, on cytology. If you have a needle aspiration uh, of these type of specimens, you can you can appreciate uh, the relatively bland nuclei, but again, with that 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 foamy cytoplasm again in a mucinous background. And then on the next slide, um, some pitfalls and some things to think about. Um, you don't want to overinterpret histiocytes. We see you know on the right hand side. Um, you know, uh, histiocytes that can have a bit of foamy uh, 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 cytoplasm uh, quite frequently, um, especially if you have like an obstructed airway or if you have some mucostasis and you have a little bit of just fibrinomucinous debris in the background with a lot of um, uh, uh, pulmonary macrophages. You don't want to overinterpret that as a mucinous tumor. And then on the left hand side of the screen, um, goblet cells. And so um, with bronchial brushings, um, sometimes even with needle aspirations and patients with chronic ear airway irritation, uh, asthma, COPD, where you actually have goblet cell hyperplasia, that sometimes can be a pitfall um, where you see a lot of these bland goblet cells that certainly can look like uh, the, the low-grade uh, uh, mucinous type cells we see in invasive mucinous adenocarcinomas of the lung. Um, and so the clue here is, again, um, uh, are, are they cohesive? Are those goblet cells attached to ciliated bronchial epithelial cells? And so if you have a little bit of intact tissue architecture, you know, that can point to an airway lining uh, origin of those cells uh, and not um, uh, and not representing the tumor mass itself. And so um, uh, the clinical presentation and uh, the type of specimen uh, that you're getting, you know, can be helpful to prevent you from going down the tubes of uh, overcalling an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, either of the lung or metastatic to the lung.
Thanks, Paul. And, and uh, very quickly, uh, you know, again, just to just to reiterate the pathology uh, that we're seeing and what um, in this particular case, based on uh, uh, kind of clinical exclusion of, of spread from uh, um, outside of the lung, um, we have uh, mucinous epithelium, well differentiated, uh, in this case, um, largely uh, filling in the, uh, the lung parenchyma with quite a bit of a uh, fibroinflammatory stroma uh, admixed between those uh, those tumor cell nests. Um, again, very difficult to differentiate on morphologic grounds from um, metastatic mucinous tumors such as from the pancreas. Um, but in this particular case, invasive mucinous out of the carcinoma of the lung was the um, the final diagnosis. Um, in the next case, pretty straightforward one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is a patient with known colon cancer, um, and you can see the. Chest CT done for staging demonstrates multiple pulmonary nodules and masses, presumably metastatic. Uh, I think in this case, biopsy was done either for confirmation or even for, um, you know, sort of gen genetic testing. Yeah, and cytologically, um, in contrast to most uh, lung adenocarcinomas, where the morphology really isn't all of the, all that um, uh, specific for it being a lung primary. Um, dealing with colorectal adenocarcinoma on the cytologic uh, uh, spectrum really um, is a bit more characteristic, where we have the, the hyperchromatic columnar cells with dirty necrosis um, that recapitulates uh, what we see on cell block on the right-hand side very nicely. So, you know, really nice uh, examples of uh, metastatic colorectal adenocarcinoma on this uh, FNA biopsy. And, and indeed, the same on uh, on a core biopsy, and and in cases like this, as as um, as Paul alluded to, this is often a fairly straightforward morphologic diagnosis. Um, we will occasionally perform confirmatory immunohistochemistry staining. Um, the challenge or the potential differential diagnosis in somebody who doesn't have uh, an existing uh, uh, history of uh, colon cancer is whether or not it represents a primary enteric type adenocarcinoma of the lung. Um, and um, in this particular case, you can see again that columnar, columnar morphology, the relatively hyperchromatic nuclei, a little bit of dirty necrosis. Um, you know, one of the hints that can be helpful here, you can see just off on the edge uh, that there's actually a vascular structure here that's been uh, occluded. O oftentimes, this can help point us to uh, metastatic um, uh, disease, which is, has led to this um, obliteration of the, uh, the local vasculature. Um, so, so in this particular case, given the strong uh, clinical history, we would just sign this out as consistent with metastatic colorectal carcinoma. And again, as, as Mark alluded to, this was a, a patient who I believe was uh, getting enrolled in the clinical trial for whom this biopsy was necessary. Uh, so again, metastatic colon cancer. Um, and this brings us to our final section on pleural disease. Uh, recognizing we have seven minutes left um, in, the, um, in the session, we'll go through this quickly. We may need to skip one or two of the, the final um, entities here, but we'll get through the the, the main um, the main players. And so, Mark, I'll let you take it away from here. Okay, sure. So we have a seventy nine year old man who was originally from the Dominican Republic, although had emigrated to the United States quite some time ago. Presented with shortness of breath, um, was found to have a pleural effusion, uh, which kind of was persistent or recurrent over time. Um, we can just skip to the imaging. Um, which shows on the uh, left panel, we've got a loculated pleural effusion. You can see it's not really free flowing, but it has kind of almost like a pocket-like structure. Um, there is a little bit of pleural enhancement, although difficult to appreciate. Um, and there's also increased extra pleural fat, actually right where Lynette had her arrow. Um, and the presence of an increase in the extra pleural fat is tends to suggest a chronic process. Uh, the right side shows an FDG PET CT. It was performed uh, because of the you know clinical differential of uh, malignancy, um, although of course the pet doesn't show anything surprising in the plura, there's, there's striking FDG uptake here, um, but did not show any uh, other sites of disease elsewhere. Yeah, so uh, the cytology, uh, uh, looking at uh, the tapped pleural effusion uh, here, uh, uh, pleural effusions can be extremely useful for diagnosing uh, malignancy uh, and other processes. Here, what's, what's pretty striking, um, uh, whenever we, we look at uh, effusions from serous fluids, we, we look for mesothelial cells, we look for histiocytes, we look for lymphocytes. Um, what's striking here is that this is a really, um, uh, uh, really lymphocyte-rich uh, effusion. So uh, more, many more uh, small round lymphocytes that we would uh, typically see. And so 
you could potentially could worry about um, uh, 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 involvement by a low grade lymphoma. Um, you know, in the instance, flow cytometry would be very useful, or you could do some stains on um, uh, on the cell block. But um, uh, other uh, other etiologies would be an infectious etiology. Um, uh, uh, but somewhat nonspecific. But importantly, we don't see any clusters of epithelioid cells or anything worrisome for metastatic carcinoma uh, or anything of that nature. Uh, and actually, a pleural biopsy was obtained in this case. And um, this is a low power view of the parietal pleura. You can see all of the soft uh, tissue of the chest wall. Here is the, um, the pleural surface. Um, and you can see some lymphoid aggregates um, below the pleural surface there and some areas that uh, are forming these kind of nodular um, aggregates. They're obviously much more pronounced here. And it kind of harkens back to our patient with sarcoidosis where we saw those, uh, those, those uh, well-formed granulomas. Um, so zooming in uh, to one of these, you uh, again can see a very pronounced uh, lymphocytic background. Uh, and this process is just of sitting on top of that um, parietal pleural uh, fat uh, in the chest wall. Uh, granuloma, but you know, in, in contrast to our patient with sarcoidosis, you can see that there is an area of central necrosis um, in, this, uh, in this particular focus. Um, so this is a necrotizing uh, granulomatous uh, pleuritis. Um, and um, uh, we perform uh, special stains for organisms, uh, maybe not surprisingly, uh, because uh, the sensitivity of, um, of, of special stains in the tissue is on the low side. Um, this ultimately was diagnosed as uh, a mycobacterial tuberculosis um, infection based on, uh, based on culture results in this, um, in this individual. And as you can see from the note that we included in this case that the sensitivity of, detect, of AFB standing in particular for detection of mycobacterium in this context is only about 60%. So it's really essential that these types of findings get correlated with, uh, with the microbiologic culture uh, results and any serologic findings. Um, and then I think we'll make this our very final case and go ahead, Mark. Okay, sure. So um, here we have another old gentleman, older gentleman, 76 year old man, a former smoker presenting with weakness and weight loss, as well as some discomfort in his left chest. Um, and we can go to the imaging showing. So we have nodular left pleural thickening um, on the CT and the PET CT shows that it's FTG avid. Um, in this case, the pleural thickening is much more marked than in the other case. It's very nodular. Um, so really not much of a question that this is malignant. Um, one thing I can also point out, uh, which is best seen on the top right image here, is that along the mediastinal pleural surface, that there's some thickening, uh, which is highly suggestive of a malignant process. Usually benign processes spare the mediastinal pleural surface for, um, for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, malignancy and, you know, the differential diagnosis here would be mesothelioma or metastatic disease, particularly metastatic carcinomas, uh, depending on clinical history, of course. And uh, Paul, go ahead and walk us through that differential. Yeah, yeah. So again, uh, uh, effusion specimens are, are, are one of the primary ways in which um, you know advanced stage malignancy is worked up. And so I, uh, I show a couple of examples of first some sneaky uh, things on the effusions. And so um, metastatic small cell carcinoma uh, can be very difficult because, especially on an effusion specimen, the uh, you don't see as much of that molding. You don't see as much of the characteristic findings for of the small cell carcinoma that you do see in histopathology. Um, some of the clues, though, are compared to the background lymphocytes, um, the cells are a bit larger um, and do have a little bit of irregularity to the nuclear membranes. And so they, so they can be very subtle, but, uh, but quite ugly looking cells. And, and, and oftentimes you'll see increased mitotic activity in those cells and maybe even a necrotic background. And so metastatic small cell carcinoma on effusion specimens can be tricky. Another kind of rare, uh, rarely encountered metastatic malignancy to the pleura that sheds into the uh, pleural effusion is uh, non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Again, it can uh, it's a, tends to be a little bit more cohesive, and it's rare to actually have um, uh, to see those in pleural fluid specimens. But kind of like some of the other non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas we saw before, hyperchromatic nuclei, um, uh, non-keratinizing uh, uh, cytoplasm, and immunostains would be very helpful to characterize that tumor cluster. Um, speaking about tumor clusters, that's really what we're looking for in, in serous effusions. And so if you see large clusters of cohesive epithelioid cells, 
that tends to be abnormal. And uh, more, more often than not, it's indicative of adenocarcinoma, lung, uh, lung adenocarcinoma being the most primary, uh, uh, pri the most uh, frequently encountered adenocarcinoma in pleural fluids. But of course, in women, breast cancer uh, is, is very common as well. For these, we're looking for round cannonball uh, cohesive uh, uh, clusters of epithelioid cells. On the cell block, you tend to have a little bit of what's called a lacunar artifact or clearing around, um, uh, around the uh, cell cluster, which can be a, a useful clue to hone your eyes in on there. But again, a, uh, a smooth uh, community border is oftentimes seen as, as shown in the upper right-hand corner of those clusters of cells. And so that points a little bit more towards adenocarcinoma as the etiology of those cells. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, uh, mesothelioma, certainly, you know, as, as a plural primary uh, malignancy is, is important to think about. And so here on this low power um, view of a thin prep, uh, a Papanicolaou stained uh, thin prep slide, you can see that there are multiple cl cohesive clusters of epithelioid cells that, you know, is, is very abnormal and should raise a red flag whenever you see that in an effusion specimen. If we go to the next slide, um, looking at a little bit higher power. So this is a, uh, an air-dried cytospin that really nicely shows the mesothelial morphology of these abnormal clusters. And so you can see the zone of exclusion between each of the cells. And so those are the, the spaces that are uh, left clear uh, basically uh, due to the long microvillus border seen on the uh, surface of mesothelial cells. And mesothelial cells, again, tend to have really prominent nucle single nucleoli, uh, slightly off center. And uh, of, of note, too, in contrast to the very smooth um, community border seen uh, with metastatic adenocarcinoma, cytologically, mesothelioma tends to have a little bit more of a knobby uh, uh, border to those cell groups. If you go to the next slide, um, Immunohistochemistry is very important. So um, when you have this abnormal epithelioid cell population, first step is to confirm: Are we dealing with um, are we dealing with mesothelial lineage? And so calretinin WT1 positivity um, will rule that in. And then the second step, as well as a benign or malignant. And so it, over the last couple of years, we've had increasing use of immunohistochemical markers, uh, BAP1. A uh, loss of BAP1 is seen in a majority of uh, epithelioid uh, mesotheliomas. We can also use immunohistochemistry for MTAP as a surrogate marker for the 9P21 locust uh, 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 showing deletion there. So if we have a nuclear loss of BAP1 staining or uh, cytoplasmic loss of MTAP, uh, that can really be a good way on cytology specimens to uh, make a definitive diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma. Um, but really, uh, the, the surgical pathology biopsy specimen is, is, is very helpful for sarcomatoid mesotheliomas or to uh, prove in the invasive growth nature of this mesothelial population. And so uh, on uh, uh, a pleurectomy specimen, which we will see for management in some patients uh, in the background uh, pleura, sometimes we can see Highland floral plaques, which are stigmata of exposure to asbestos, but these are not in and of themselves precursor lesions for mesothelioma. And you get this basket weave hyalinization sitting, uh, sitting with a very clearly demarcated border on top of that uh, parietal pleural uh, chest wall soft tissue. Um, in contrast, if you look at an area that's involved by um, mesothelioma, as was the case uh, in this individual, uh, you can see, again, this lobulated growth of uh, very cellular um, uh, proliferation on top of the, uh, that parietal pleura um, in some areas where it's beginning to invade into that uh, uh, chest wall soft tissue. Uh, here's just a higher power view of it. This, these cells piled up on top of the, uh, the parietal, parietal pleural surface. And in higher power, um, the relatively monomorphic appearance that you often see with epithelial mesothelioma, fairly abundant cytoplasm. Um, uh, we do see quite a range of, of uh, histologies for a particularly epithelial mesothelioma. This is more of a solid growth pattern. Uh, oftentimes, uh, despite very aggressive behavior, we may not see very brisk mitotic activity. This particular case did show areas of necrosis, so a combination of higher nuclear grade, as we are seeing in this particular area, and necrosis would put this into a high grade uh, epithelial mesothelioma. 
Um, if, however, you see areas um, uh, that appear like this, which are spindled, this would be considered a sarcomatoid component, and together with the epithelioid, we would diagnose this as a biphasic mesothelioma, in which case grading is not necessary because of the recognition that a biphasic or sarcomatoid growth confers much more aggressive behavior uh, in mesotheliomas. Um, so in the end, this was uh, called a mesothelioma biphasic type uh, that was involving parietal and visceral pleura, as well as chest wall adipose tissue, along with that highland pleural plaque. Um, and I, that, that's actually our, our last case. Um, I will go ahead and end our, our slideshow. Um, and I, I, think, I think, Dan, uh, tell us what more you need us to do at this point if, uh, if we just go ahead and say, say thanks or if, if we would want to answer any questions. Uh, I see. Uh, actually, I just got a note from Dan that he actually had to join another call. So um, um, we can go ahead and take, uh, take questions if folks uh, either want to un unmute if they can do that or put any questions in the chat. Um, I think maybe we can take two minutes to answer questions if our panelists have, have two minutes to spare. Folks, just one minute to put, a, put questions in if they have them. And if they don't, um, I think as Dan uh, mentions, these, these slides will all be uh, made available for, uh, for your review. Um, I, uh, you know, hope, hopefully this was uh, an informative session. Uh, I learned a lot uh, working with my colleagues. Um, I, you know, a lot of uh, gratitude to Paul and Mark for their incredible um, expertise and, and really lucid discussions that they brought to the, um, brought to the conversation today. Um, uh, any parting words from either you, uh, Paul or Mark? <laughs> no, I just said, yeah, I think it was a really, really fun session, you know, from my perspective as well. I think it's great to see the kind of seamless integration of the, the radiographic features, the, the cytology, the histopathology, how it's, it's all very complimentary, right? And um, uh, it, it, again, you know, the one plug that I would put in for all the pathologists in the audience is, is you know, in your organ system, get familiar as best you can, you know, with looking at the images, you know, so you can start to appreciate, um, you, know, you know, the findings, help hone your di differential. And, and, you know, again, in your mind, adjust the pretest probability of what you might be looking at, because that um, uh, can really save you some time. And, and um, uh, again, at least uh, understand the brilliance and the, the, the amazing differentials that our radiology colleagues can come up with. And so, uh, you know, again, Mark, tip a hat to you, and, and thanks for such great discussions of these uh, radiographic images. Yeah, thank you uh, both. I mean, I really enjoyed the session, too. It's it's always nice to have the full circle because sometimes we make suggestions and we, you know, don't quite know what it turns out to be. So it, it's nice to see the full circle and, you know, kind of integrate all of that together. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Mark and Paul, and of course, a, a thanks to Dan and the um, and the team who pulled this all together. Um, I really appreciate everybody's participation in the session today, and um, and take care.